Hello and welcome to our Bible class for October 17th, 2021. Uh, we're continuing to look at uh, hope for the future, messianic prophecies in Isaiah. Uh, and we're looking at Isaiah 35, so we've skipped ahead a bit from where we have been in Isaiah 7, 9, and 11. But this reads as follows. Uh, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a high wave shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Uh, and so again, looking at Advent Christmas themes as we're looking ahead to, to the Messiah coming. Um, so we hail to the Lord's anointed. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. To, he comes to break oppression, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. He comes with rescue speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy and bid the weak be strong to give them songs for sighing, their darkness turned to light, whose souls condemned and dying were precious in his sight. He shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth, love, joy, and hope like flowers spring in his path to birth. Before him on the mountain shall peace the herald go, and righteousness in fountains from hill to valley flow. All right, and so again, we've skipped ahead to... Uh, from where we were towards the beginning of Isaiah to now towards the middle uh, or towards the end of the first section. Uh, and one way that I heard that this, these four chapters that we're looking at, well, we're looking at the last one, uh, are dealing with kind of future shock and future glory. Uh, one of the commentaries mentioned the quote, you know, the future's not what, what it was. Um, and that's some of what Isaiah is looking ahead to here. Um, but to kind of give, give the immediate context, um, so I've got a couple of titles, both from either from a commentary or from uh, the he heading of heading of uh, one of the Bibles I looked at. Um, so Isaiah chapter 32 can get summed summed up as a king shall reign or a king will reign in righteousness. Uh, Isaiah 33, uh, Jerusalem will be delivered, or O Lord, be gracious to us. So talking again about um, about God saving His people, restoring His people. Uh, then Isaiah 34. Um, so immediately preceding what we just looked at, uh, the sinful world will be judged, judgment on the nations. Uh, and verse 2 kind of sums up this chapter fairly well. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the immediate context of Isaiah 35. Immediately preceding it is Isaiah 34, which is full of judgment and wrath. Um, and so then we get to Isaiah 35, which is then looking ahead to hope, future. Um, yeah, so, so Isaiah 35, uh, the glorious kingdom will be established. And that's what we're looking at. So, um, so looking ahead to, you know, partly fulfilled in Jesus and in, in Jesus' first coming and looking even further ahead to the second coming and the restoration of all things. So the wilderness and the dry ground shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. All right, so when, remember when we're talking about the wilderness, um, you know, this is kind of what we're talking about, not just, you know, open fields we've got here in Iowa, um, but kind of dry desert stuff. Um, the Hebrew word for it is midbar, um, it's usually translated as wilderness or desert. Um, 
one of my theology professors in college would, would make a big deal out of the fact that debar, um, so this part is, is the Hebrew word for word, uh, and then putting the mid in front of it kind of makes it is a negative, so it's almost like a wordless place. Uh, and so we see that happen uh, sometimes as well. Um, so because it's not just a, necessarily a physical description of, of a wild place, of a desolate place, um, but it's kind of a spiritual description as well. Uh, of course, you know, wilderness pops up a lot in the Bible. Uh, Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. David was in, driven into the wilderness as, when he's escaping the wrath of Saul. And Jesus spent 40 days being tempted in the Transjordan wilderness by the devil. Um, so it's an iconic place of deprivation, suffering, want, and need. Uh, the anti-Eden, again, we talked about that a little bit um, last week looking at, at Isaiah 11, uh, that we're looking ahead to how things will be restored uh, to the way they were before, creation, or before sin entered into the world. Um, so Eden, you know, of course, you know, water flowing, grass, plants growing, animals living in peace, all that stuff. That's what we're going back to. So the midbar, the wilderness, is kind of the opposite of that. Uh, the God-forsaken place, um, the wordless place, but it's also then where the children of God undergo testing in life. Um, and so, so, so wilderness has a lot of things going on in it for the people of the Old Testament that Isaiah is talking to. Um, so the wilderness, though, then the promise, promise we're getting is that it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. So this wordless place shall have singing. This desolate place shall blossom. Um, you know, and then the glory of Lebanon shall be given it to, to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. All right. Uh, cedars of Lebanon were famous in the ancient world. Uh, they get mentioned a lot in the Old Testament, but uh, mentioned throughout the world, too. Uh, even the current nation of Lebanon has a picture of a cedar on their, you know, as one of their symbols, as their flags. Uh, of course, uh, Lebanon's made the news uh, this week because there's more civil war uh, fighting stuff there. Uh, and, you know, over, over, over time... You know, by, by this point, the, uh, there's not a whole lot of cedars left, um, you know, through deforestation and stuff. Uh, but the cedars were famous in the ancient world. So, again, from wilderness to a place with these giant trees that are, you know, famous, um, you know, infamous in that area, uh, that's a pretty big change. Uh, then Carmel's mentioned where um, Saul erects a monument after his expedition against the Amalekites, and it's mentioned also in... Later in 1 Samuel 25, 2 is the place of Nabal's possessions, who was the husband of Abigail. Uh, that's well, um, well, we might look at this in a little more detail on sun, on, if we're in person on Sunday. Uh, but if you look at, look at 1 Samuel 25, uh, David's on the run, asks for help. Nabal says, why would I help you? Uh, you know, if I help you, I'm going to have to help every other brigand that comes, comes through. Abigail figures out this is... You know, David's on God's side and, and so helps David and his men uh, without it, her husband knowing. Uh, and then her husband gets struck down by, by God for having not helped David. And then Abigail ends up marrying David. Um, so, you know, that's a really brief overall summary. But in, in any case, Carmel's, the, the context is Carmel is, is a very fruitful uh, place. So again, not wilderness. Uh, and so, again, it's also strategic importance because it had the only reliable natural spring of water in the immediate area, which wa whose waters are collected in a man-made pool. Uh, again, you know, part of why wildernesses are in the, in the desert uh, is so harsh is because there's no water. And so sources of water were very important uh, and because water brings life. You need water to have life. And so uh, since Carmel has a natural spring, uh, it would be a place of life. Um, all right, and then the plains of Sharon, um, looking, looking out this way, yeah, you can see the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, it's one of the most populous areas in the current nation of Israel, uh, you know, one of the most prosperous, one of the most um, uh, greenest farmland. So that continues, idea continues. So again, you've got wilderness on one hand, God's making it into the most fruitful places you know, most productive places, greenest places that you, you, you could make. All right, so then the people shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. 
All right, and so God's glory uh, is is a big deal for Isaiah. He mentions it 37 times throughout his throughout his his book, throughout his prophecies. Uh, kavod is the Hebrew word for glory, um, and so and glory it tends to be this. Uh, or similar to God's holiness, uh, you know, you know, bright, powerful, overwhelming thing. Um, you know, the, uh, they talk about you know when Isaiah has, has his vision in the temple, he has a, sees the glory of God. Uh, when Moses is up on Mount Sinai, you know, getting the Ten Commandments, and there's fire and smoke and earthquakes and everything. That's the sees the glory of God. Um, but of course, then the the New Testament way, you know, how are we? How how do we see the glory of God? Well, we see the glory of God in Jesus. You know, as, as John reminds us, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, so again, you know, the glory of God, not something we can usually comprehend or or deal with on our own, um, you know, in its own full and varnished glory. But at the same time, um, you know, in Jesus, we can see God's glory and God's condensed it, um, you know, made it, made it, kept his glory. He's still glorious, but he comes in a way that we can actually comprehend. All right, then looking ahead, what's Isaiah going to do? Well, we need to strengthen the weak hands, or God's going to do, according to Isaiah here, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. And then say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Um, for behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. So t say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Uh, you've heard me say a few times, um, in, in sermons and such. Uh, there's allegedly uh, 366 occurrences of fear not throughout the Bible. Uh, so one for every day of the year plus an extra or for, the, for leap year. Uh, and, and so God tells us to fear not, but it also, usually when we're told to fear not, it's because God's promising to be with us, God's coming, uh, God's going to be with us. God's going to save us, um, you know, for those, those sorts of reasons. Uh, and, of course, be strong, fear not. Um, we get told that a few times. Uh, well, you know, one of the most common occurrence, uh, re best well-remembered occurrence of that, be strong, is courageous. Uh, you know, some of you may use this as confirmation verse uh, from Joshua. You know, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do, do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Um, so we've got, again, that don't be frightened, don't be afraid. Why? God is with you. Uh, and so because God's with you, you can be strong and courageous. And so as Isaiah is looking ahead, again, this, this is towards the end of the first half of Isaiah. Um, so we're getting to the point where the um, Assyrians are going to conquer Israel conquer the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom is going to face some challenges as well so um, so the people need encouragement and that's what God's giving them all right then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy for waters break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert um, all right and so we hear, hear this a few times then uh, but Jesus, especially in uh, in Matthew and Luke, uh, I've got the Matthew version here. Uh, so, uh, use, uses paraphrases uh, this idea. So now, when now when John the Baptist heard about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, "Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another?" Um, so, and again, remembering in this context, um, so John the Baptist is arrested because <coughs> because he'd told. King Herod that marrying his brother's wife was a bad idea uh, and King Herod didn't necessarily appreciate that but his wife, his now wife definitely didn't appreciate it so John got arrested um, and so he, so he is in prison and, and so we get this, this change from you know the great powerful John, you know, John the Baptist standing in the river calling the Pharisees brood of vipers uh, to him kind of in, the, in, the, in prison uh, and what kind of doing all sorts of reflecting, wondering what's going on with his life, wondering, 
you know, was it worth it? Uh, and so, you know, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So John knew his job was to prepare the way for, for the coming Messiah, but now he's kind of having doubts. Um, because now that he's in prison, he's having doubts whether Jesus actually was. So he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask this. And then, and Jesus answers, go and tell John what you hear and see. And this is where we get the paraphrase. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news to preach to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Um, so, you know, again, re paraphrasing this um, this Isaiah passage, that the bl eyes of the blind shall... Be so, what's, what's it going to look like when the Messiah comes? Blind... Eyes of the blind are opened, ears of the deaf unstopped, lame leap like a deer, and the tongues of mute sing for joy. So the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear. Uh, Jesus adds, you know, some of what he's more he's doing. But you know, lepers are cleansed, dead are raised up. Um, so again, Jesus, Jesus is telling John, look, here here's the signs that the Messiah is supposed to do. Here's what I'm doing. So just go. So go tell John what you see and hear. I'm doing what the Messiah is go going to do, what, what the Messiah was prophesied to do. All right. Now we're also talking then about ways in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Um, again, you know, deserts are um, part of the, the challenge in, in uh, deserts and wilderness uh, is that they're dry. Um, so streams, um, you know, water is very important. And so uh, having streams in the desert is really important. That's where there's signs of life. And the catch is uh, usually uh, streams are, are fairly temporary. Uh, in fact, sometimes they can be fairly destructive. The, you know, wadis or, um, you know, dry arroyos or uh, creek breads are some of what we talk about in, in, in U.S. deserts. Um, that they, they fill up rapidly and can be very destructive just because you go from no rain to lots of water going through these places. Um, but they're also then still usually in the, in Israel was in, so, in the same way, but the, it's often a bigger focus on, on the life-giving aspect of the water that's coming through. Um, all right, and so the burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. So it's not just there's going to be streams, but there's going to be water in other, other places too. We talked about... Um, uh, you know how the uh, how Car uh, Carmel was the important because it had a spring of water, uh, and so if you those were the places where there was life, where you could live in the wilderness. Uh, and that's again, there's going to be more more of those. Uh, if you've ever been on a beach, of course, you know, obviously there's lots of water there, but burning sand, uh, hard to walk on. Uh, but if the burning sand's a pool, a little easier to walk on there. All right. All right, and then in the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reed and rushes. And so we end up getting, again, the going from this wilderness, this dry and desolate place, to this lush, green, water-filled place. Um, you know, that ba again, back to the way that everything was supposed to be until sin entered into the world. And so that's what Isaiah is looking ahead to. All right, and then, no, and then a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. And so uh, highways are important. Uh, we find highways uh, described a few times in Isaiah and a few other times in the Bible uh, that, uh, of course, highways are, are important as, as as ways ways to go. Um the, the, the catch is for, for Israel, they tend to be uh, kind of a, a two-way uh, street, tend to have some negative aspects to them. Um, the Assyrians built some good highways, built some good roads, uh, but that was so they could move their army more effectively. Uh, and then same with the Romans later. Uh, I mean, that's, and that was, I mean, in some ways, the you know, basis for our interstate system as well, uh, to make sure that things can move quicker. Uh, and the idea is, is that military you know, forces can move quicker, uh, which is good for if you're in charge of the military, bad if you're on the rece receiving end of the military, and that's some of what Israel was often. Um, the, what I, and what Isaiah is dealing with is the Assyrians are getting ready to uh, conquer the northern kingdom at, at this point. 
But this isn't going to be a highway that the enemy is going to use. This is a highway that the people of God are going to use to get to where they're going. Um, and so, um, you know, again, looking looking ahead, we're starting to look ahead a little bit that, you know, when the people are taken off into exile, the highway, the road they go on is, is going to be bad for them. Um, but on the when, the when they come back, when they're restored from exile, the road that the, they're able to go on safely, that will be a good road. Uh, good way. All right, and it's also going to be, be safe, uh, we'll, and we'll talk about that too. So uh, unclean shall not pass over it. Again, it's just for the people of God. Um, and even the fools shall not go astray, so must have some good curbs or walls or something, uh, you know, to keep, keep people on the straight and narrow. Um, and again, one of the other places we hear about um, highways in Isaiah um, is Isaiah 40, the beginning of that next section, of, of the second section of Isaiah, uh, where we go from kind of the warnings and judgment that exile's coming to hope while you're in exile. Uh, and again, you know, we talked about John the Baptist earlier asking Jesus, you know, are you the one who is to come? Well, here's, of course, the prophecy we, we associate most cl clearly with John the Baptist. The voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. Uh, and, and note note here, too, again, we've talked in the uh, women's study a bit about the you know, challenges of working in different languages um, and things. And here's, you know, again, a little thing, um, but a thing to notice, uh, that a voice cries in the... The voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now here in, he here in Hebrew, or here the, you know, the, the translation of the slides using, uh, the voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So the voice is saying, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. But when we look at John the Baptist, uh, the quotes in the Gospels, the punctuation comes after wilderness. So a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and that's... You know, because John the Baptist is in the wilderness. Again, you know, minor moving of a comma, but, you know, that, that really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, but, you know, doesn't, um, you know, because John's both in the wilderness crying, and he's, and he's telling people in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, but again, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God's coming, uh, and God, God needs a way to come. Uh, of course, God's coming, and we really doesn't need a way. He's going to make his own way. Um, but yeah, and so again, highway appears several times throughout Isaiah. All right, and then looking ahead here. Um, so no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Uh, again, kind of building up what we talked about last week with Isaiah 11 when we're looking at, um, um, you know, Isaiah 11 talks about the lion and the lamb lying down together. Uh, here we're looking at more, it's just, well, they're not going to be there. Um, but again, the, pointing to that idea of safety and security, able to travel safely, so there's not going to be any wild animals that you have to deal with on the road. You know, a lot of times for us, you know, <laughs> wild animals we have to deal with more are, are just deer or uh, raccoons wandering into the road, that kind of thing. We don't have a whole lot of lions or wolves that are going to try and attack us in our cars. But uh, for the people of Israel, uh, you know, people in the Middle East at this time, especially because they're walking everywhere, uh, you know, wild animals were, were, were a challenge, uh, were a problem. But they're not going to be, again, looking ahead to when God comes and restores everything. Uh, and then the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So again, we're looking ahead to the promise of return from exile that uh, the ransomed of the Lord, so God's done something to save them, to redeem them, to buy them back. Um, and the, uh, returning to Zion, uh, they've been take, taken away into exile or well, they're going to come, come back. They're going to come back, but not not with sadness, but with singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, um, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So, when we see that happen again, when the people of Israel are, re or when the when the southern kingdom is, uh, when they're restored from exile, uh, but looking ahead to when we're when the exile on earth uh, caused by sin is ended, and we all go to the new Jerusalem uh, that God's preparing for us at the end. Uh, and so then uh, we'll close with a, the, another hymn that uses some of this stuff. 
um, lift every voice and sing. We sang it over the summer. Uh, not we don't not necessarily as as well known as it could be. It's gained some. Uh, been in the news a little bit because it's supposed described as the black national anthem, uh, but it kind of also points to that idea that these promises of Isaiah, of hope, you know, have, were grabbed upon, uh, you know, by by people in in hopeless situations, uh, like you know many African Americans uh, have been in our in our history, and so they took those those same themes uh, and used them in their in their spirituals in their songs on hymns and still sing them today um, as any of us who we go through uh, hopeless uh, challenge, times of hope uh, times where we need some hope and encouragement um, so we'll end looking at this lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Faving, facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let, our mar let us march till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed. Again, kind of, the, kind of that recalling the promised land stuff we've been talking about. We have come over a way with tears that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. So thank you very much for listening.